My name is John Harrison and in this forthcoming presentation I'm going to be talking about measuring cognition in depression. So in terms of the structure of the presentation I'm going to begin by talking about the domains of cognition, simply put what are we measuring, and I'm going to go on to why measure cognition, so the idea that we can detect cognitive deficits um, and also how we can measure cognitive change and a corollary to that claim is we'll need to talk about what makes a good test and that's what I'll be considering in the third part of the presentation. So let's begin with some thought about what we're measuring, the domains of cognition. And we have this idea that cognition can be helpfully divided into some subcategories. So cognition is essentially the ability of people to think. And under that heading, we would consider things like episodic memory, so people's ability to remember events from their life. And we talk about working memory. So this is the space in your cognition where you solve problems. If I ask you to take seven from 100 and keep going, working memory is the part of cognition where that's going to happen. And we can think about attention. And that's really just a psychologist's word for talking about concentration, focusing your attentional abilities, vigilance, a number of ways in which we think about it. But at their core is you're paying attention to something. And the idea of paying attention, I think, implies that it's an effortful process. Paying attention quite literally requires cognitive effort. And we can talk about executive functions, and this is where we're not quite so clear. We don't have a hard and fast definition, but we usually mean stuff like planning ahead, organizing your thinking, dealing with novelty. These are the sort of facets of human cognition that we put under the umbrella term executive functions. And whilst on the topic, there's some areas that are sometimes described as cognitive domains, but might more reasonably be thought of as outcome measures. So for example, particularly in the major depressive disorder literature, one reads about and hears about psychomotor speed. I think psychomotor speed is rather more of an outcome measure than a cognitive domain. So if a patient is slow at whatever task we ask them to do, I'd contend it's because they have some problems in the other areas of cognition I've described, working memory, executive function, attention, etc. So I don't think psychomotor speed is a cognitive domain, I think it's an outcome measure, and I'd say much the same for things like social cognition. I think social cognition is cognition in the terms I've described it, but in a social context. So the cognitive domains that I think are of principal interest to us would be episodic memory, working memory, attention, and executive functions. And why do I think that's interesting? Well, it's not just me. There's a good deal of literature on this, and we recently benefited from a, a very significant review of cognitive deficits in a variety of psychiatric disorders, benchmarked against a couple of neurological disorders as well. And as the slide you can see witnesses, there's good evidence in the minds of the authors that some very key areas of cognition are impaired across a variety of disorders. So I'm talking about major depressive disorder today, but in fact, most of what I'll say to you about cognition testing would be equally applicable to these other psychiatric domains and indeed to lots of aspects of neurological assessment. But let's go back to major depressive disorder. This particular slide is one I could have shown you from a whole host of possibilities, but it's a convenient slide because what it does is it characterizes the average cognitive impairment seen in patients with major depressive disorder across a variety of different tests and a variety of different domains. So there's, to the left of the slide, a number of computerized tests of assessment. And the argument I'd like to make is that, on average, the level of impairment seen in patients with major depressive disorder across all the domains measured is in the area of about 0.8 of a standard effect size. The two tests on the end are verbal fluency and a test um, that we would recognize as being a test of looking at people's ability to inhibit, so the Stroop test. They are paper and pencil tests, but the magnitude of the deficit reported is really very similar to the ones we see on the computerized tests. Um, we have a sort of shorthand for thinking about the importance and magnitude of effects, which is effect size, depicted here on the y-axis. And the line I can show you now is drawn at the minus 0.5 standard deviation level. And this is um, what I think the most liberal interpretation of a clinically relevant effect might look like. But a much more consistent level of impairment would be minus 0.8 of an effect size. 
and this is what the second red line shows you here. So I think as well as showing you that computerized and paper and pencil tests of various domains can detect evidence of impairment in major depressive disorder, they're also of a magnitude that is likely to be clinically relevant and therefore in need of remediation. On to the topic of cognitive domains in the context of meta-analysis, so that we have many very useful meta-analyses of cognitive impairment in major depressive disorder, sometimes at first episode, sometimes between depressive episodes, and, and oftentimes the authors uh, tend to combine measures into convenient packages. And we often have a variety of cognitive domains that are indicated. The caution is that's sometimes an oversimplification. So I'm blowing up part of the wheel here, and you can see that there are some tests that are described simply as psychomotor speed tests. And amongst them are things like digit symbol coding. So I do think that we get a measure of psychomotor speed when we apply this test, but to suggest that it's only testing psychomotor speed is a simplification. It's actually testing lots of different domains of cognition, working memory, various other aspects to people's cognitive skills. So recognize that when you see these convenient labels of cognition measures into cognitive domains, it almost certainly represents an oversimplification. So what does a good test look like? Well, a good test, I think, is a version of digit symbol substitution that you can see here. So if I roll the test, you can see what's happening is that across the screen, various numbers are coming up and what the patient needs to do is press the symbol that goes with the number. So lots going on there. It's a computer equivalent, we believe, of the paper and pencil digit symbol substitution test, has been shown to be sensitive to impairment in patients with major depressive disorder, and perhaps just as importantly, has been shown to be capable of detecting positive effects of interventions, pharmaceutical and indeed others. So as a class of tests, it's a very useful test. It measures lots of different domains of cognition. And that means that if you're impaired in any one or more of them, the test theoretically can detect that impairment. Equally, if I give you something that might rescue your cognition, the test is capable also of capturing that improvement. So a very useful test, very brief, relatively easy to administer. But what it doesn't tell us is which domains of cognition are impaired and it doesn't tell us which domains of cognition can be rescued with an intervention. And to do that, we need to be a bit more sophisticated. I'll look at how that can be achieved a little later in the presentation. So why measure cognition? It's not an unreasonable question, and I think we try to do lots of different things. One of them would be to detect the evidence of deficit. So if we had an opportunity to screen patients, to establish is there any evidence of impairment, a good cognition test can tell us about the presence of cognitive difficulties, and a good one can tell us about its magnitude. So a clear opportunity is in the detection of cognitive deficits. Equally assessing change. So if we feel that there's a component to the disorder where we might reasonably expect the patient to get worse as time progresses, mm -hmm. being able to capture that is clearly very important. Equally, if the question under consideration is, is my intervention safe? or is my intervention efficacious? We need to be able to capture cognitive change across time in order to determine whether these interventions have a positive or possibly even a negative effect. The other thing we're very keen to do is to capture evidence of phenotypic characterization. So in the pursuit of detecting early cases, people who may have not yet have manifested their first episode of MDD, can we predict who they're going to be it might well be that we need extremely sensitive measures and therefore good, sensitive, reliable measures of cognition are clearly of significant value to us. And finally, a biomarker, possibly not so much in the case of major depressive disorder, but in neurodegenerative disorders of which depression can be a component, it's very helpful to have a marker of change. And we're traditionally used to thinking of brain imaging and blood assays as um, biomarker measures, but cognition under the right circumstances and well managed could equally yield helpful biomarker data. But I think a corollary of that is that we might need to get used to the idea that screening measures and measures of cognitive change might not necessarily be the same test. So we're traditionally looking at impairment. Most patients come to our attention because they are experiencing a change in their cognition 
which is manifest as an impairment. So we've gotten used to measuring half of the distribution. We're really looking at impairment only. And in the context of an intervention which might improve, we clearly need to be looking in the other direction too. So clinical psychology is really founded on tests that are measures of impairment. And whilst we can learn a good deal from clinical psychological testing, the areas of cognition that are impaired and how best we might measure them, we might have to use more reliable, more appropriate tools for capturing the issue of cognitive change. And in the second half of this slide, you can see that, in, that premise made as a, a pictorial representation. So the question, does the patient have cognitive dysfunction, is certainly one question. But then the question of, has there been a cognitive change, we might have to get used to the idea we need different measures to establish these two things. So we've talked a lot about tests, but what makes a good test? Okay, so there's some good guidance that we can recommend. And across a number of indications, various authors have put together their own version of the following list. So we want tests that are reliable. So if we want to measure the patient more than once, do we get a relatively similar level of performance? If we put the test in the hands of different raters and we administer it to the same patient, do we get roughly the same score? Does the same rater administering the test to the same patient consistently get a reasonably high level of reliability? So reliability is a very key requirement to what we do. We also want to be mindful of sensitivity. So particularly in the context of looking for markers that will predict future behavior, greater sensitivity almost certainly is our friend and ought to be something that is an aspiration. There are some very good tests with high sensitivity, but there's a good many that we use in practice that honestly really don't have that characteristic. Validity is the third element we'd look for. Does the test measure the things we know are interesting in this disorder? And if it is, then we can claim it has a high level of validity. There are some other flavors of validity, but largely it's about does the test measure what we believe is important and interesting, in this case, in major depressive disorder. And tests are the mini mental states exam word registration is typically always apple penny table. And if the patient's done the test before, that might be something they already know. So it's not really testing episodic memory, it's really looking at other aspects of cognition. So a good way to man manage that is to have different word lists for each occasion that you see the patient. Finally, just be mindful of its use cross-culturally. It makes perfectly good sense to ask people in North America what season it is. It makes much less sense to ask people in Singapore the same question. So always be mindful of the appropriateness of the test to the population you're seeking to administer it to. So a good test, I would argue, should be like a thermometer for cognition. It should be reliable, valid, sensitive. If I don't like the first answer I get because it looks wrong, I can stick the thermometer back in and take a second measure. But what we almost always do is the equivalent of holding our hands to the head of the patient to estimate cognition. And I think this is the analogy I would use with some of the more popularly used measures, like the mini mental states exam. We could, should, and I would argue must, do better at capturing reliable, valid, sensitive cognitive data and I'm afraid tests like the Mini Mental States exam probably aren't the kind of measures that are gonna give us that. So in the context of looking at initially screening for cognitive deficits in patients with major depressive disorder, um, a group of us have gotten together and tried to establish some basic paradigms packaged up as relatively brief, reliable, valid, and sensitive measures, which could be applied by researchers, people in primary health care, by secondary and tertiary referral centers, and we call it Thinkit. So Thinkit is the umbrella term for three key tests of cognition that we think are valuable in detecting evidence of deficit with the potential to be used as measures of cognitive change also. And we've augmented those core tests with a subjective measure, the five item version of the perceived deficits questionnaire. And we've also put in an extra measure of executive function, a repeatable trails B as an optional fourth objective cognitive test. And the output of this is, should be fairly easy for interpretation. We've made a very simple um, algorithm where we characterize performance as green, essentially fine, amber, borderline, and red, where there's conspicuous evidence of deficit. But if you want fine-grained detail, it will also give you percentile data, z-scores, and many other formats for the data for your interpretation and understanding.
So what do some of the tests look like? Well, this is our version of a choice reaction sign task. So a very traditional paradigm for looking at attention, one of those cognitive domains I described earlier. And what you can see with the test is that there is an arrow pointing either to the left or the right. And what the patient needs to do is to press the left-hand side button if the arrow points left and the right-hand side button if the arrow points right. And they do about 30 trials of this and we measure the average latency for correct responses. There will be some errors in there, but they're usually in the air region of about 4%, and this is well documented and understood in our measurement of attention as indexed by choice reaction time paradigms, of which this is a very good version. So that's our metric for attention. Again, brief, typically two to three minutes, relatively easy to administer, hopefully fairly easy to interpret, and a good candidate as a robust, reliable, valid, sensitive measure of attention. How would we look at executive function? Well here what we've done is we've taken a very traditional trails paradigm and we've made it into a touchscreen version. So the patient here needs to move between the category of numbers to letters and back and forth in an ascending order until they get to the end of the trail. And here we're measuring how quickly do they get from the start point to the end point. And the good thing about this version is that it has parallel versions. The traditional paper and pencil version always presents the same trail, and there is a danger that people simply get better because they learn the trail. Here, that's less possible because each time they see the test, the trail is very slightly different. Very good test, very reliable measure, and sensitive, we believe, and the evidence supports this from the literature, to evidence of difficulties with executive function. So there are a couple of the paradigms we've used. The Thinkit tool is looking at attention. It's looking at working memory with a, a one-back paradigm. It's looking at subjective impressions of cognitive deficits using the perceived deficits questionnaire. And typically is going to rival the administration length of an MMSE, a mini mental states exam. So on a good day, sailing through the, the tests, you're probably going to be able to capture performance in all of these measures in somewhere like about 12 to 15 minutes. And therefore, we think a very reasonable measure of these key areas of cognition using very robust, reliable paradigms. In terms of general advice, I think it's always useful to target pertinent domains in the evaluation of cognition in patients with major depressive disorder. Across a number of domains, we see typically somewhere between 0.5 and 0.8 of an effect size deficit. And that seems to be true almost of all the areas of cognition we look at. So there's plenty to target when looking at major depressive disorder. I think we need to be mindful that sometimes our cross-sectional tests of screening, so the measures we use to establish the presence of a deficit, might not necessarily be the tests we use to look at cognitive change. And again, it's about selecting the right test for the right question. And on that topic, it's about picking tests according to best practice. So across any indication, major depressive disorder included, I would advocate that we need to specify the cognitive domains that we believe are interesting, and we need to set out best practice guidance for good test selection. But I think we ought not be dogmatic. There are many very good wordless learning tests measuring episodic verbal memory. It's very hard to choose between them in terms of which one is superior, and if, they measure the same domain and they do it efficiently and meet best practice guidance. I think we should be less concerned about the specific test, but much more concerned with best practice guidance and the selection of appropriate cognitive domains. My name is John Harrison and I've been talking about measuring cognition in patients with depression.